Greetings, my name is Tony Fauci, and I appreciate the opportunity to be able to present to you today a summary of where we are with COVID-19. As you can see from this title slide, I have chosen as my title, coronavirus infections more than just the common cold. And this relates to a viewpoint that I wrote recently, actually in January for the Journal of the American Medical Association, in which I wanted to make the point of the historical perspective of how we got to where we are with coronavirus infections. If one looks at the coronavirus phylogenetic tree, you could see in red are what we refer to as the human coronaviruses, namely those that have infected humans. Obviously, this is not just a human infection since bats and other intermediate hosts are important reservoirs of this virus. Prior to SARS and MERS, which I'll get into in a moment, there were four coronaviruses that were responsible for about 15 to 30 percent of the recurrent common colds that we all get usually during the winter season. However, the issue of the possibility of a coronavirus being a pandemic came upon us in 2002 with the severe acute respiratory syndrome and then again in 2012 with MERS. Let's take a look at SARS, our first entry into the realization of the poten pandemic potential of coronaviruses. It started off in the Guangdong province of China in November of 2002 with what was described as an atypical pneumonia, which the Chinese were saying was influenza, an unusual strain of influenza. As it turns out, it wasn't until four months later when someone, in fact, went from Guangdong to Hong Kong and stayed at the Metropole Hotel and was infected there and infected 19 people from that hotel who then went off and did what people who usually come to Hong Kong do. They get in a plane and travel throughout the world. And there again was the beginning of the pandemic of SARS because within a period of time from November of 2002 to July 2003, there were over 8,000 cases and close to 800 deaths. Now, apropos of what we'll be talking about at COVID-19, there were some substantial differences between this SARS coronavirus and what we'll refer to as SARS coronavirus 2 in a moment. The outbreak was contained by a number of strategies, isolation, infection control, quarantine, travel advisory, screening at airport. And in fact, it was clear that although this was transmissible relatively easily from person to person, it did not have the absolute overwhelming efficiency and capability of spreading from human to human. And so what happened, measures like physical separation, mask wearing, quarantine actually turned the outbreak around within a period of time as shown on this bar graph map that by the time we got to June and July of 2003, there were essentially no cases. In essence, the outbreak was controlled by purely public health measures without any drugs and without any vaccines. Fast forward 10 years from then, in 2012, another pandemic potential coronavirus emerged. And this was a novel coronavirus that emerged in Saudi Arabia. Just the way the SARS 2002 went from a bat reservoir to a civet cat, which are generally served at festive meals in China, this Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus went from a bat to a camel to a human in Saudi Arabia and then began infecting considerable numbers of people. Although the, the fatality rate, similar to the original SARS, which was about 10% that I showed you a moment ago, the fatality rate of MERS was about 35%. And this is a map showing the number of cases and the number of deaths and the geographic distribution. Of note, MERS is still smoldering up to this day. Again, outbreak that is mo moderately well, if not very well controlled, since the number of cases 
are relatively small, but we still have cases cropping up, unlike SARS, in which it essentially disappeared. So let's go to where we are today with the SARS coronavirus 2. The name of the disease is COVID-19 for coronavirus disease 2019. The name of the virus is referred to as SARS coronavirus 2 because of its close phylogenetic proximity to the original SARS coronavirus 1. So here we are right now in the middle of July with close to 14 million cases globally and 580 plus thousand deaths thus far with essentially no end in sight. The United States has been hit harder than any country in the world with the most cases at now 3.4 million and the most deaths at about 136,000. So let's just now take a look at some of the aspects of this infection. First, the virology. It's a beta coronavirus. As I mentioned earlier, the same subgenius as the original SARS virus. It's a positive sense single-stranded RNA. It has a number of structural proteins, the most important of which is the S protein or the spike protein, which allows the virus to attach to, fuse with, and enter the host cell via the ACE2 cellular receptor. Transmission is respiratory route, direct person to person, usually in close contact, which is the reason why we ask that people maintain a six foot distance. It can be by respiratory droplets that generally drop within three to six feet from the time they are expelled. But there's considerable interest now in the relative role of aerosol transmission, namely with droplets less than five micrometers. It is unclear the extent to which this is responsible for spread, but most people feel that it has some impact on spread. The virus is detected in a number of bodily fluids, but their role in transmission is uncertain. Animals can be infected, but again, their role in transmission is uncertain. An important bit of knowledge that has just now been confirmed is that about 20 to 45% of individuals who are infected are without symptoms. This is very important when one thinks of tracking transmission, particularly the idea of contact tracing. Clinical presentation has protean manifestations strongly um, uh, resembling an, in an influenza or flu-like syndrome with fever, cough, fatigue, anorexia, shortness of breath, myalgias, as I mentioned again, very closely similar to a typical flu-like syndrome. One thing that is interesting that has been reported consistently now is the loss of smell and taste, which actually precedes the onset of respiratory symptoms. The thing that I've been most impressed with this of all the viruses that I've been dealing with over the last several decades is the extraordinarily wide spectrum of disease where you get 20 to 45% of people who are completely asymptomatic and several others who can be pre-symptomatic in their spread. Then you have a range of mild illness, people who need to stay home for a few days, people who are in bed for weeks and have post-viral uh, syndromes, people who require hospitalizations and when in the hospital, oxygen, intensive care, intubation, ventilation, and even death. So it's so extraordinary you have, you have so many people who have no symptoms at all, and then those who are, have outcomes that are very, very difficult, including hospitalization and death. If you look at the distribution of the percentage of people with mild to moderate disease, certainly the overwhelming majority, with a relatively smaller percent having severe and critical disease. And when you look at the case fatality rate, including the severe disease, it's about 2.3%. But if you count all of the people who are asymptomatic, it's likely that the total fatality rate is probably around 1% or less because of those number of people who get infected but who have asymptomatic infection. People at risk for severe disease, older adults, 
And in fact, if you look at this bar graph, you can see in the rate per 100,000 population hospitalized that younger individuals on the left-hand side of the slide have a very low rate per 100,000. But as you gradually progress in age, as you can see, when you get to older than 85, you have almost 600 rate per 100,000 population for hospitalizations. But it is important to point out that people of any age with certain underlying medical conditions are at high risk for severe illness. And that includes chronic kidney disease, obstructive pulmonary disease, any immunocompromised hosts, such as with solid or organ transplantation, obesity, heart conditions, diabetes, sickle cell disease. And then there's underlying medical conditions that may confer an increased risk. The literature are not as firm as on the previous slide. And you can mention, you could see these here. I need not go through all of them, but a couple are noteworthy, such as the use of glucocorticoids, pregnancy, hypertension, HIV infection, et cetera, et cetera. If you look at the age associated race and ethnicity distribution of COVID-19 hospitalization rate, you can see the disproportionately high rate of hospitalization among minority communities, such as Black, such as Hispanic Latinx, such as American Indians and Alaskan Natives. The manifestations of severe disease, again, are protean the acute respiratory distress syndrome being the most typical. But there's also manifestations of hyperinflammation with cardiac injury, including arrhythmias and cardiomyopathy, renal disease, neurological disease, hypercoagulability, anything from a stroke involving a major vessel to microthrombi in venules. And then there's an interesting multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, which we're learning more and more about that strikingly resembles what we see with Kawasaki syndrome. With regard to cancer, COVID-19 related reductions in cancer screening because of the total country lockdown that we and other nations have experienced project that over the next decade could actually result in 10,000 or more excess deaths from breast and colorectal cancer because of the reductions in routine screening. The test for SARS coronavirus 2, the typical one is the test for the virus or the molecular test using PCR. Another is a more recently introduced test for antigen, such as a spike protein. One can scale up much more readily with antigen tests. And then finally, there's tests for the antibody to determine if you've actually been exposed and infected. The durability of that antibody response is now trying to be tracked, but it is really quite unclear is how long these antibodies last. These are something that is gonna be followed very closely. Let's move now to therapeutics. Here is a list of some of the therapeutics. I'll get to remdesivir in a moment. That is a direct antiviral, but there are other broad spectrum antivirals as well as a number of studies that are already ongoing on looking at the utility of convalescent plasma, as well as hyperimmune globulin, which is derived from the convalescent plasma, repurposed drugs, hydroxychloroquine, which essentially all the studies have now shown it to be ineffective, as well as other drugs like lapinavir and ritonavir. There are immune-based therapies to dampen the inflammatory response, as well as monoclonal antibodies directed specifically against the virus. Let me take a minute to tell you about the Remdesivir study, which was the first randomized placebo-controlled trial in COVID-19 in hospitalized patients. Over 1,000 individuals studied in 10 countries. The results were significant, but showed a modest but definite decrease in the time to recovery, about 32% decrease. Another study from the UK, another randomized placebo-controlled trial, looking at patients in the hospital on ventilators or receiving oxygen compared to individuals with early disease. And it was very clear that dexamethasone, given as six milligrams a day for up to 10 days, 
had a significant impact on decreasing mortality in the patients on ventilators and those requiring oxygen, but did not have a positive effect and maybe even a negative effect in people with early disease, which goes right along with our understanding of the pathogenesis of this infection, where early on you want to block the virus, but you want to keep the inflammatory and immunological response intact. Whereas later in the disease, when it becomes more advanced, you do really have that much viral activity perhaps, but you certainly have a lot of aberrant inflammatory response, which you want to dampen down, which obviously the dexamethasone did. I want to point out that the NIH has initiated a panel which is responsible for keeping as a living document online treatment guidelines for COVID-19. The data are uploaded on this uh, regularly, depending upon the evolution and the, and the availability of new data from clinical trials. One can access this by just linking on to COVID-19 treatment guidelines .nih.gov. Let's move on to prevention. Some public health measures that are broadly applicable. The bottom line common denominator is physical distancing. And this can be accomplished by stay at home orders, closing or modifying school schedules, bans on public gatherings, travel restrictions, and then followed by aggressive case identification and contact tracing. Personal preventive measures include common sense approaches, diligent hand washing, avoiding close contact, as I mentioned, more than six feet away, covering the mouth and the nose with a mask or a cloth face covering, personal hygiene, respiratory hygiene, like covering sneezes and coughs, avoiding face touching and regular cleaning of inanimate objects. With regard to vaccines, we at NIH have taken a strategic approach. We are supporting directly or indirectly a number of candidates using different platforms, but we have tried to harmonize the approach so that even though you have multiple candidates with multiple platforms, you have a common protocol that is in many respects quite similar one to the other. You have a common DSMB, common primary and secondary endpoints, as well as laboratory data that's compatible and interchangeable. This is the list of the three major platforms that are being pursued and where they are in the various phase one and two trials. There's the nucleic acid, mRNA. There's viral vectors, either VSV, chimp adeno, AD26, or protein subunits. One of these has just now getting ready to go into a phase three trial at the end of July. It's one of several, so there's no statement as to what is better than the other. This one temporarily happens to be ahead. And a phase one trial showed some very promising data, was published online just a few days ago in the journal, the New England Journal of Medicine. And what it showed in 45 individuals that even the moderate dose of this mRNA platform induced very robust neutralizing antibodies that were at the level or greater than what you would see with convalescent serum, which is really very good news because one of the tenets of vaccinology is that you'd like to get a vaccine that induces a response that's comparable to a response that's induced by natural infection. And it looks like that is actually the case right here. So let me close by showing a slide of a paper uh, that was written in the Lancet Infectious Diseases 12 years ago by my colleagues and I. We titled it Emerging Infections of Perpetual Challenge for the simple reason of what I've essentially give you an example of today is that we've always had emerging infectious diseases. We have them now and we will continue to have them in the future. So just as emerging infections provide for us a perpetual challenge, we need to be perpetually prepared. Thank you for the opportunity to present this to you and I wish you a successful meeting.